Good evening, Bahamas. This is NB12, broadcasting from Cable 12 Studios on Robinson Road. Here's what's making news tonight. The Hotel Union questions the Reef Village deal on Grand Bahama. The road improvement project nearing completion with the signing of another loan. DNA leader Brando McCartney addresses the Constitutional Reform Commission, plus BTC does its part in the fight against breast cancer. Those stories and much more on the way. I'm Nikia DeVoe and NB12 starts right now. Joining us here at NB12, leaders of the Bahamas Hotel Catering and Allied Workers Union are questioning Hutchinson Wampoa's ability to create some 1,000 jobs with the reopening of the Reef Village on Grand Bahama. Hotel Union President Nicole Martin pointed out that before the resort's closure last year, it didn't even employ 600 people. So she is questioning where the 400 plus jobs will come from, especially considering the resort has just over 500 rooms and will be all inclusive. Vonig Toot reports. Officials here at the Bahamas Hotel Catering and Allied Workers Union are all for the creation of 1,000 jobs on Grand Bahama. However, Hotel Union President Nicole Martin is a bit skeptical about where all of those jobs will come from. She says as far as she is aware, the Reef Village cannot accommodate 1,000 workers. Prime Minister Perry Christie announced on Wednesday that the Reef Village would be reopened thanks to a joint venture between Hutchinson Wampoa and Canadian travel industry conglomerate Sun Wing. He said it would create some 1,000 permanent jobs and hundreds of construction jobs. Martin says the union would know what those jobs are if government had engaged them in discussions as promised. If we've had no opportunity to speak to the government, we have no idea. Now, if there is a thousand jobs, I would be quite interested to know where those jobs are going to be, because the Reef Village, unless they're building a new hotel, cannot occupy a thousand workers. But that might be a spin-off number, um, spin-off employment because of the opening. But again, it's speculation because we have not been engaged. We don't know. The Reef Village is part of one resort, the Grand Lucayan, which has two physical structures. The reef closed in March 2011 due to low occupancy levels. Before then, Martin says it employed around 570 people. At its maximum, they never employed a thousand with both sides. So it'll be interesting to know where the thousand jobs will come from. And let me say, if there is a possibility of a thousand permanent jobs, we are all for it. When asked if she thinks 1,000 jobs is wishful thinking on the part of the Prime Minister, Martin replied, I will not attempt to speak about the thinking or the mindset of our Prime Minister. I will not do it. While she is happy that the Reef Village is being reopened, the hotel union president is also concerned that Hutchison Wampoa plans to employ casual workers. It is a worker without any real status. That worker will work for whatever amount of days for the week and will be paid. There is no substantial position that that worker would hold. They have no permanent status, and as a result, they cannot qualify for credit at the bank. So it, it, it is incumbent, I believe, on the government and the union to protect the status of work for our people. Because in Grand Bahama, I believe workers are being exploited. They are being told that you should just be grateful to be working. Martin says she attempted to discuss the issue of casual workers with Grand Bahama Minister Michael Darville months ago, but he insisted that she leave it alone. Hotel union executives had expected to meet with Prime Minister Christie before Wednesday's news conference to discuss the reef. However, that did not happen. Martin says she believes there is still an opportunity for the two sides to have meaningful dialogue on the deal. 
The hotel union has requested another meeting with Prime Minister Perry Christie. However, officials say so far they have not received a response. Reporting for NB12, I'm Vonnie Tude. The president of the Umbrella Union National Congress of Trade Unions has joined the chorus of people calling for the resignation of Bahamas Nurses Union President Cleola Hamilton. Hamilton retained that post and the position of Trade Union Congress first vice president even after being elected South Beach Member of Parliament and appointed Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well, Jennifer Isaacs Dotson believes this has serious moral implications. We definitely see it as a conflict. As I said yesterday, Rao Day will come with the government of the Bahamas. When Rao Day comes, which side will Miss Hamilton choose? Will she be with the workers or will she be with the government of the Bahamas and the Progressive Liberal Party, which she was elected to? It will be very interesting to see the choice that she makes because it will, you know, she may make the decision now to continue, but at some point, a decision will have to be made by her. Which side is she going to choose? Also, as parliamentary secretary, she's privy to information. She's privy to a lot of information that she could share with the union. Is that a conflict of interest? TUC President Obi Ferguson defended Hamilton yesterday, saying she isn't going anywhere. He also argued that Sir Randall Fox was once a politician and trade unionist. However, Isaacs Dotson says that was during a different time when the labor force faced different issues. The NCTU president also commented on the BNU vice president's claim that Hamilton is playing an important role in the ongoing negotiations for the union's contractual agreement with government. So she's sitting now. So who is she negotiating against? She's negotiating against herself in reality. She's sitting to the table negotiating against her government. I mean, that's not a conflict of interest. Or oh, I guess they hope that they will get everything that they ask for then, and then they will set a precedent for the rest of us to follow. Because if they give the nurses certain things, then we expect it as well. Prime Minister Perry Christie and Labor Minister Shane Gibson recently claimed it is a common practice throughout the Caribbean. However, Trinidad and Tobago Senator and Trade Union Leader James Lambert has said he does not know of any other Caribbean country where an elected member of parliament serves simultaneously as a union leader. Well, more than four years after the signing of the initial contract for the New Providence Road Improvement Project, the end seems to be in sight. This as Government Today signed a $77 million loan with the Inter-American Development Bank for the completion of the project. Christina McNeil was there and filed this report. Cost overruns always raise questions within the Inter-American Development Bank. That's according to an IDB manager. However, he says that the benefits of the New Providence Road Improvement Project continue to outweigh the costs, hence the bank's determination that the project is worth finishing. Manager in the IDB's Caribbean Country Department, Gerard Johnson, signed the loan on behalf of the IDB today, noting that the decision to grant another loan for the completion of the NPRAP was not an easy one. It wasn't a slam dunk. It wasn't uh, an easy uh, path in our board because cost overruns always raise questions. As a result, the due diligence that was done in this case was very complete. It was uh, reviewed by many eyes, including independent eyes. And the important thing, which is why we're here today, is that at the end of that process, the benefits continue to far outweigh the costs, even the increased costs. The IDB has agreed to loan the Bahamas $65 million for the completion of the project, with government providing $12 million in supplementary financing for a total of $77 million. State Minister for Finance Michael Halkidis says government already has some idea of where that additional $12 million will come from. We have several options on the, on the table as to um, where it would um, come from, and um, it's, um, we don't envision it being a, being a difficulty. Despite the challenges in getting the project to this level, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Public Works and Urban Development Philip Davis says he will see the project through to completion. I am of the view that all parties involved in the completion of this project may reiterate that more dialogue should have been held with stakeholders relative to the design phase. More meetings should have been convened to ensure that the voices of all beneficiaries are heard. 
and more appropriate channels of communication established from the outset in order to address public opinion. These sentiments are all legitimate and in moving forward must be addressed to mitigate cost overruns and other associated difficulties. When a new government meets a project like this, the most responsible thing to do is to bring it to an efficient end and then review in order to protect against the public having to pay even more for any hasty decisions. During the, four, the year following the official takeover by the government of the project, our engineers will continue supervision of the finishing tasks as well as assessments of the quality of the work as the roads and the water remains are used for the consuming public. The contractor will remain in place to carry out any necessary remedial work. This thorough assessment of the project should unearth problems which would be corrected. Davis adds that government is always looking at ways that cost overruns may have been avoided so future infrastructural projects do not have the same type of cost overrun challenges. All work is expected to be complete by January with a defect period of one year during which the contractor will be responsible for repairs. Reporting for NB12, I'm Christina McNeil.